Hi guys, today I'm going to talk to you about gel electrophoresis and I'm using the Learn Genetics Virtual Lab for gel electrophoresis. If you have not already printed the handout that I made to go with this, go ahead and get this printed before you start watching the video. Um, it's just a place for you to take some notes so you can process what we're learning about in this virtual lab. And I want to thank Learn Genetics for this amazing resource. I'm making this video to just guide people through it and also because some people can't access Flash Play and Flash Player is no longer going to be working by the end of 2020, theoretically. So in gel electrophoresis, what we're always trying to do um, with a horizontal gel is analyze some DNA. And you can see in this diagram, we're looking at a plastic tube with some clear liquid, but there's DNA in there and the DNA has different lengths. And in gel electrophoresis, we're figuring out what the lengths are. So that's actually what goes in the first space finding the lengths of various pieces of DNA. So if we could see DNA with the naked eye, we could just sort them and look at the lengths, but they're too small to see with the naked eye. That's the next blank on your handout. So if you can't see them with the naked eye, then we need to use a different process. We can use electrophoresis for molecules too small to see. When we do a horizontal gel, we're using it for DNA. You can't even see DNA under a microscope, so we need to use this process. Now we can also use this for molecules like proteins and in my medical interventions class through Project Lead the Way, that's what we do, which is really cool. But most of the time in Biomed, at least, we are looking at DNA. So the next thing is um, that third blank is for proteins. Here is our gel, and we use a gel made of agarose. You can see what it looks like up close on your handout on the left on the top. There are visuals of what the pores look like. So the agarose gel um, is how we actually filter the DNA. Okay, so on your handout, it says the agarose gel filters and it's going to sort the DNA as well. So you've seen the DNA loaded into the gel. And it's like a sponge because there are lots of tiny holes or pores all through it. If you look at this, you should know that DNA has a negative charge. So we're using electricity in this case. The DNA has a negative charge. There it goes. It's called electrophoresis because it's electricity that causes it to move through the gel. And because it's negative, it's going to move toward the positive electrodes. You can see that the pieces that traveled the farthest and the fastest were the little pieces. So the smaller pieces travel farther and fastest. We have to add stain. So the second to last blank should say staining. Staining makes the, v the DNA visible to the naked eye. There are different kinds of stains that you can use, and when you use them, the DNA fragments show up as bands. So all those little red lines, those are bands of DNA. Now we're going to go through the actual steps of gel electrophoresis, and we should be on the second part of the handout where we're summarizing the steps. I've already listed step one is make the gel, and I've shown a picture of the gel. So let's see how we go about making a gel. There you can see all of our supplies. So the first thing we need is agarose, 
And you should go ahead and say that word, agaros. That's probably new to a lot of you. We need agaros. It already says buffer. We need a flask, a microwave, a gel mold, and a gel comb. And it is really similar to Jello, to the gelatin and Jello. That's what the agarose is like. Agarose, though, comes from seaweed. But like Jello, it's technically edible, not the kind in the containers from the chemical supply company. But you can buy agar, it's called agar agar, and use it in cooking. And sometimes vegans do that because, unlike gelatin, it doesn't come from animal products. So I put the powdered agarose into the flask. On your handout, it says agarose is like gelatin, but made from, and the answer is seaweed. It's even used in some ice creams. Then we have the buffer, and it says right here, the buffer is a salt water solution. So add that, buffer is salt water that allows electricity. So electricity moves best through a salt solution to flow. And now I have to add my buffer. So we have our agarose and our buffer. And my students, you'll be doing this uh, next week. You'll be making your own gels. You can put plastic on the top. I actually never put plastic on the top to keep it from boiling over. And then you put it in, you heat it up. It doesn't take very long, um, a minute or less if you have a very small amount. And then you take off the plastic wrap if you have it. What that did is melted the agarose into the buffer. And that's the next blank on your sheet. Now we wait until this cools enough that we can hold it comfortably in the palm of our hand. That's my test for it. And then we pour it into our gel mold. As soon as you pour it into your gel mold, you wanna add a comb. That's called the comb. And that's also on your handout. Pour in a mold, add a comb to make the wells for the DNA. Then you let it solidify. And depending on how big your gel is, that might take five minutes. It might take 15 minutes. It really doesn't take very long though because it's pretty thin. And then we remove the comb and we are done with step one. For step two, I did not record the name of that step, so go ahead and write it down right now. Set up the gel apparatus. So this is also sometimes referred to as the gel box. And the way that we're going to do this, we're going to get our gel. We have buffer, so more of that same buffer that we used. Pour the buffer in. You want enough buffer to cover the gel. We put the gel down, submerge it underneath the buffer. So we get the gel and then fill in the word buffer. And the apparatus, also called the electrophoresis box. They're sometimes referring to it as the electrophoresis box. We pour buffer into the chamber. These are all things that go on your handout. Remove the dams or tape. They use tape. Um, so you can use masking tape or you can use dams on the end and put the gel into the chamber slash box. And then you want to submerge it beneath the buffer. Now, in my class, we're actually going to load the DNA into a dry gel and then submerge it. But they're going to show us what's called wet loading. We'll do dry loading. So we're going to load the DNA. That's actually step three. So we're going to flip our handout over and go to step three. And you can see step three is called load the DNA. I'm just writing load DNA because um, I don't need to say the entire thing. Okay, so here's what we have. We have the loading buffer. That's different from the buffer we put in before. You can see it has a blue color. The tube of DNA, the DNA standard, we always use a standard. This is our micropipette. Here's our electrophoresis chamber or box. The gel is down in it. And here are our micropipette tips. So we're gonna start by adding the loading buffer. And that is this blue stuff. The 
The loading buffer is very thick, almost like a syrup. It's a dark blue color typically, and you add it to your DNA sample. It contains a dye, so that's the second blank, and the dye will actually let us see the DNA sample as it's running. Uh, it's usually blue. It's really dense and thick so that the sample will sink down into the wells, and it's more dense than, than the buffer around it, the saltwater buffer around it. Now we are going to use the micropipette to transfer the DNA sample into the well. So we're going to suck up some of our sample. Now my first year students, you guys won't add the gel loading dye, it's already in. In later higher level uh, classes, we do add that. So we're going to eject the DNA, put it down into the well, and you can see it sunk down in because that loading dye is heavy. This is a tricky technique. In biomed, we do it every single year, so you get really good at this technique. Now we're going to use the DNA standard that already has the gel loading dye in it. And the standard goes into, we actually usually put the standard in the first well. So this is done kind of backwards in my mind. Okay, so let's finish filling in step three. Eject each sample into each well. Those little um, indents are called wells. We're going to use a clean tip for each new sample. So those are the yellow tips on our pipette. We add a standard. The standard has DNA pieces of known sizes. So that's why it's called the standard. And we use the standard for comparison. It allows us to compare the unknown pieces and determine their sizes. And we pretty much always use a standard when we're running a gel. I've never run a gel without a standard. So now we're on step four, hook up the electrical current and run the gel. So hook up current. In other words, you're gonna power this thing. So the black goes into the black. Oh, I'm not there yet though. Here we go. We're gonna plug in the black to the black and the red to the red. And we have a power supply in our classroom. You can't run gel electrophoresis without power because you need electricity. So we turn it on. The black electrode connects to the negative end of the gel, and the red one connects to the positive end. The electrodes connect to a power source, which is plugged into an outlet. Now you see bubbles, so that's the fourth blank. Bubbles should be visible once you start the power, and that shows that electricity is moving through the chamber. I always my students should always know you don't walk away till you make sure you see those bubbles because sometimes a chamber isn't working right or the power source isn't working right and the bubbles are how you know if it is or is not. So again, the DNA is negative and negative is repelled by negative. We'll see the DNA start to move because there's a negative electrode right here and the negative DNA is trying to get away essentially from the negative electrode. It's drawn toward the positive one. We can't see the DNA itself, but we can see the tracking dye. So in that last box, we can't see the DNA, but we can see the tracking dye and that lets us know how far the DNA has traveled and when to stop running the gel. So now we're on the final step, stain that gel. We, it depends on what stain you use, but the stain is what's going to make it visible. And it might show up blue like here, or it might show up like a bright yellow orange if you use the cyber safe like we do. So they are using a kind of stain called ethidium bromide. We typically don't use this in my classroom, but the ethidium bromide is blue. No matter what stain we're using, it's going to get into the DNA, and it's really going to attach to the DNA. So right in that box, we can use ethidium bromide to stain the DNA, and it works by binding to the DNA. So it gets right in there in the rungs. But because it can bind to the DNA, can um, bond to the DNA and we have DNA in all of our cells, you always want to wear gloves to protect yourself because anything that can get in, your, get in your DNA and kind of rip those bonds apart can be harmful and it could cause cancer. 
after staining, let's see what we're going to do. We drag the gel into the stain. It takes a little time to stain, um, but when we use CyberSafe like we do in my class, you just add it right to the agarose and it's ready to view immediately. Either way, you need a light source to view your gel. So that's the last thing, view the gel on a UV light box. If you're using uh, thidium bromide, you can just view it on white light. We use CyberSafe, so we need a blue light trans illuminator. Now we're down on the final box. So we have our DNA standards. Typically we put those in the first lane and we have lots of other DNA samples in the other lanes, but they put them in the second lane. And you compare the unknown samples to what you see here. So this one lines up directly. That says it's 6,000 base pairs. So 6,000 letters long, A, C, G, T, T, that's a really long piece of DNA. Go ahead and write that on your handout, how many base pairs long that is. And make sure you include that unit, BP for base pairs. Now this one's between 3,000 and 4,000. I think it's slightly closer to 3,000. So if it were right between, I would say 3,500. But since it's a little closer to three, I'm gonna say 3,400 base pairs. Now for this last one, do it yourself. Think about what it's between. Is it closer to this number or this number? And then go ahead and estimate. And the virtual lab will let you check yourself. Let's see how I did. Okay, they said all of my estimates were good. They're actually correcting me though. They're saying it was 3,500 and 1,500. Now keep in mind these are estimates. You're not gonna know exactly. And as long as you're within a reasonable range, you're good to go. I hope that helped you better understand gel electrophoresis. Definitely you wanna actually do gel electrophoresis to really get it, but a virtual lab's a good way to uh, get a first glance at it. And if you can't currently do it in the classroom, at least you can see how it works.